Great to be here, super excited to be um, chairing this panel today um, about work, place as a service, um, with a couple of very experienced originators um, in this space. Uh, Ryan Simonetti, CEO of Convene, uh, and Anna Levine, who's the general manager of co-working for Industrious. Um, so why don't we start by quickly introducing ourselves, guys. Ryan, why don't you kick off and tell everyone a little bit about Convene. Yeah, so uh, Ryan Simonetti, co-founder and CEO uh, of Convene. Uh, our vision is really about how do you bring humanity to the workplace? Uh, and we feel that our built environments oftentimes lack a, a human component. Uh, and we do that by partnering with Class A building owners uh, to design, build, and operate a premium network of uh, on-demand meeting, conferencing, and event facilities, uh, building amenities, uh, and then recently, the last 12 to 18 months, uh, flexible workspace. Hi everyone, I'm Anna. I run the co-working network here at Industrious. And at Industrious, our mission is to make sure you have a great day at work, that you're engaged and productive, and you can really show up and do what you're there to do. So over the past five years, we've built a network of about 65 spaces in 35 cities all over the country. And we serve companies from small to large, whether it's an established five-person digital marketing team or a 200-person team from Airbus working on their drone technology. Thanks, guys. Um, I guess just quickly a little bit about myself and Equium. So Gab McMillan, CEO and co-founder of Equium. Equium is a global leader in tenant engagement solutions. So our mission is essentially to help landlords unlock more value in their, in their buildings and in their assets and to do that through deeper engagement with the customers that occupy those buildings, gathering data and insights about those customers and then creating the right experiences that those customers want to drive satisfaction, stickiness and loyalty. Um, we have a deep and broad um, data set um, due to our scale. We operate across four countries, about 60 million square feet, largely commercial real estate. Um, and we have about 135,000 users um, on our digital platform, which allows us to, to get a lot of insights about what, um, how tenant expectations are changing um, and what tenants really want in their workplaces today. So, workplace as a service. Um, is, is that what it's called now? <laughs> It's the latest buzzword, right? <laughs> um, and actually, that's a really good segue because I did want to spend some time to start with because it is a bit of a buzzword. Um, I think most of us grasp the concept of software as a service and really that's where this originated from. Um, you know, as, as software has, has also moved away from being we're going to buy, you know, we're going to build and buy every five to ten years and start all over again, we're actually going to subscribe to something that's always ready to go, that's ever evolving, that gives us what we want. Um, Anthony Slumbers actually has a really great definition for, for this, which I want to share. He's a well-known global real estate blogger and speaker. And he says, space as a service is a deceptive phrase. It is often used simply as a proxy for space that is available on demand, but it embraces far more than that. It is actually a philosophy of space, a foundational way of thinking about the spaces and places that we create, manage, and occupy. It represents an attitude of mind towards colleagues, clients, and suppliers, and importantly, between landlord and tenant. It is about thinking about service, not product, long, not short term, networks, ecosystems, and lifetime relationships with customers. In many ways, it is the antithesis of traditional real estate mindset. Do you guys agree? And how would you define workspace as a service? So you want to go me, me first? Um, by the way, when you're raising capital, workplace as a service is just phenomenal, by the way. I just want to throw that out there. Um, investors love buzzwords, by the way. One, uh, yeah, I, think, uh, I think Mr. Slumbers is 100% accurate. Uh, and I think if you take a, you take a step back uh, and I think look at what companies like Convene are doing and what companies like Industrious are doing, is we've realized a few things. Um, the first is that the way that companies consume real estate has fundamentally changed. And I think in order to understand the change that's happening, you have to think about, well, how, what's the way that it's always been done before, right? So who in here is, who has leased space before for themselves or for another company? Okay. So what would happen is a landlord, a building owner, provides a box. And if you're lucky, it's a white box. And the expectation was that a company would take that box, they would design, they, they would build, they would deliver their own experience, they would service that experience, and the landlord wouldn't really have to do anything outside of the box. And if you had a really, really good landlord, 
they would make sure that your like HVAC worked and the lobby maybe was renovated and the elevators worked. They, what they were also expecting though was that those companies were gonna be willing to sign up for a five or 10 year commitment and predict with a high degree of certainty, what is your business gonna be like 10 years from now? How many employees are gonna work for you 10 years from now? What is the design of your space gonna to need to be 10 years from now to engage your workforce to allow them to do their best work, right? What business in the world today, I don't care whether you're a startup company, an independent consultant that just launched your own business, or you're a Fortune 500 company, can predict with any degree of certainty where they're gonna be 10 years from now? Nobody. And this is the same thing that has happened in industries like data center, which now became cloud, is asset classes in industries where you have a, a fixed asset that's relatively expensive, right? Like, like an office, expensive to build, expensive to maintain, um, which are oftentimes underutilized, those asset classes tend to, over time, to end up in some sort of outsourcing business, right? And I think that's what's happened uh, if you think about workplace as a service. The new consumption model is very different than the old consumption model, which is companies like Industrious and Convene and others have said, why would we just give you a box? Let's give you an actual experience. Let's design it for you, let's operate it for you. Let's take all of the friction in how do you find a space, how do you source it, how do you build it, how do you operate it, and let's do that for you, and then just like a software company would sell you back software or a data, some data center company would give you access to a server rack, you can then buy into the convenient infrastructure, the industrious infrastructure. That is a completely different consumption model. And what companies like Industrious and Convene and others are doing is we think about real estate as a product, right, which is different, right? We think more like Tesla thinks about building a car or Apple does about making an iPhone or a Mac, which is a very, very fundamentally different way to think about real estate. And so all of those things that Mr. Slumber said is true. And then the real question I think for companies like us is, well, what's next? Right? And I think part of what we're gonna talk about is, is what are we seeing and then what is the next iteration of this? Because you know, this trend, you know, we launched the company in 2009, so we've been doing it for a decade. Uh, WeWork launched in 2011, Industrious was 2012. Um, for companies like us, I mean, we've been doing this almost a decade now. Uh, and you know, I would say we were probably all a little bit too early and this real shift in the consumption model has really accelerated since really 2015. Uh, and so what I'm most excited about is this next chapter that we're in right now. So there are a few changes. Oh, sorry, do you want to add to that, Anna? I was just going to add, I think, um, as Ryan's saying, even the framing of workplace as a service, or in this definition, space as a service, is um, incongruous with how the customers, both landlords and tenants or members that we serve, think about what they're buying. And what we see they want to buy is business outcomes, right? Like the only reason they need space is because that they have a team. And the only reason they have a team is because they want to drive their business or their institution or their nonprofit. And so what they want to buy is productivity. And they want to buy happy team members. And there are many inputs that are related to where you might happen to be that produce that. Um, and so over and above the space and the design and the service layer, and creating an experience, I think what, what ultimately companies will outsource is the ability for us to provide ingredients that make their teams productive. And we're starting to reach a tipping point where companies like Convenient and Industrious can actually do that better than most companies can do it for themselves. And so unless you work for Google or Facebook and you happen to work in their headquarters where every service you might need is available to you and the companies are able to invest a tremendous amount in your experience, you will ultimately need another expert to say, hey, here's a 95% product. How can we customize it to meet the needs of your culture, of your team, of your business goals? And how do we marry that with the kind of risk profile that you need because you can't see well into the future and yet you still need these outcomes now? Good definition, Gus. Um, so I think we've established that it's, I think you were quoted recently, Ryan, as saying it's not a fad. Um, I think this is definitely something that occupants are looking for and they really are expecting their workplaces now to support them in the way that they need to attract and retain talent. And they need that to be done by their building or their workplace provider because equal to that, they want flexibility and they want to be able to scale up and down and spread out depending on where their workforce is and deal with that unpredictability in their, um, their organisations. So I think it's here to stay. Um, 
what I do want to talk about next is just to change some of the commercials, I guess, of, of this kind of new real estate model um, and what that means for both the occupier and the landlord. And one of the things that, you know, that we're seeing is that you guys as, as workplaces as a service operators um, seem to be moving away from, uh, you know, a situation where you just take the lease and moving towards more of a partnership or a, or a management agreement, um, almost becoming a, 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 manage, a new breed of property management. Um, is that a trend that you guys are seeing and is that how you see your businesses now? Uh, yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, we always look at the, the hotel industry as, as a great analogy. Um, and uh, you know, the, for those that know kind of the history of the hotel industry, um, when Marriott, Sheraton, uh, IHG, when, when all of these brands first started, they had to own all of their own property. They had to develop a hotel. Um, there was no such thing as a, a franchise or a brand management agreement. And then throughout the evolution, um, they went from owning corporately to doing something called a propco and an opco, which is they split away their brand and their management company. And as opposed to them having to constantly raise capital at the corporate level, dilute themselves and go find properties, because the biggest barrier to Marriott success was actually capital, right? And there was only so much that they could do and there was only so many deals that they could find independent of themselves. So what they did is they aligned with big institutional investors, um, some of them real estate asset managers, and they would raise money in these property vehicles. And then that group would then go out and find all these properties and Marriott and Hilton and Hyatt started to become what we know them as, say, as, as brands and management platforms. If you look at those companies today, they're all brand managers, right? A, hotel year says, I found a great site and here's the brand that I think is gonna be best able to deliver value in that site, okay? The same thing is happening in our industry, which is the same thing that's happening in co-living today. And so yes, we are a new version of what I would think about as a branded property management platform that understands how to create value and deliver experience to today's defined customer uh, or end user. So for Convene, we have a million square feet open um, of that million square feet, 30% of that is under a managed contract between us and building owner, which is typically structured just like a hotel management contract, a percentage of gross revenue, and then some sort of profit-based split. Of the million square feet that we have under construction today, almost 50% of that is managed. So we're seeing a massive shift away from us having to sign leases, I think about as corporate-owned, to this new sort of brand-managed partnership-driven model. And then we have another, I think, three and a half or four million feet in our pipeline. And most of that is under a managed partnership-driven structure with building owners. So to me, the future of our industry is probably less of us signing leases and more of us better aligning ourselves with building owner. Um, and you know, I think that that's a trend that's here to stay. The only thing holding that back from becoming the standard is actually the capital markets right now. So the debt markets and the equity markets, which drive a lot of the decision-making and behavior from institutional owners, hasn't yet figured out 100% how to value the income streams that come from companies like Industrious and WeWork and Convene and others. We're close to them figuring it out. Um, and I would say in the next two to three years, I, my assumption is that the capital markets will figure this out. Uh, and then companies like us um, will really be branded operating platforms that understand how to create magical experiences to uh, our collective customers. I think it's also allowed us, us both really, to work with landlords who have not traditionally held commercial assets. Um, who in some cases have the appetite and the creativity and the license to try things out that big institutional landlords who are beholden to their lenders don't. Um, and so for example, we recently opened a very large space in the largest luxury mall in Arizona in Scottsdale. It's called Fashion Square. I didn't know about it before we uh, signed it, but many people do. And we didn't really know what was gonna happen. Um, and yet, we're almost 100% full and it's been open for 10 weeks, so we're like, hmm. You know, not only is this clearly providing, meeting a need in the market, there are people in Phoenix who would really love to work in this spot and are excited to bring their clients to this space, but from Maserich's point of view, the landlord, they are thrilled and they are getting far more from this relationship and this partnership than they did when that same space was a Barney's 
And they're also learning a lot more strategically than they would if we had just signed a lease. Um, so I think there are probably many similar things like that to follow, and, and since then we've signed many more retail opportunities, and I am sure that it will extend into other kinds of space as well. So how do the commercial stack up for a landlord in macro terms? Can a landlord make um, more money off the same square footage in a partnership with you guys because the NOI is so much higher on short-term leases? Yes. 100%, and in fact, I think there are many parts of the value proposition to them, but as we underwrite it together, which is fun to do, to sit in the room with a landlord and look at the numbers together, the whole premise is that we can each make more money that way. Um, and so sometimes when you're splitting gross revenue or you're splitting profit, they're, they're, you, know, you can structure agreements so there's some floor um, because the economics of the combined partnership can be so much better than either one of us trying to do it ourselves. Yeah, just to put some context, just metrics to this stuff. So in, um, you know, Convene, we have two products. We have a, a meetings product and we have a workplace product. Um, each of those, to some extent, have different unit economics uh, associated with them. And in most of the deals that we do kind of strategically in partnership with building, and we're actually stacking the two together. Um, in our meetings product, um, we can generate, so if rent is, say, 50 bucks or 60 bucks a square foot, um, we stabilize those units on a revenue per square foot basis somewhere from four to six times whatever a landlord would generate in a market lease. We operate that business pre-rent at about 70% margins. So if a landlord partners with us, we could take what would have been $60 space or $50 space and actually net the landlord well over $100 a square foot. At the same time as we're netting them more capital per square foot, we're creating an absolutely incredible amenity for an office building that completely differentiates that building from the building next door. Because if I was a tenant moving into that building, would I build out my own boardroom for 50 people? Would I build out a town hall space for 200 that I use four times a year? Would I build out my own kitchen and hospitality infrastructure if I could get it from Convene vertically delivered to me in my building? Now, workplace doesn't generate the same yield per square foot, but our workplace product generates anywhere from two and a quarter to three times what the market rent equivalent would be. Now that business has less overhead, less cogs, less labor, and in those situations we can generate for a building owner somewhere between a 50 to as high as 100% premium off of what they would have otherwise generated from a market rent perspective. So not only can they make more money, but at the same time they're creating a hospitality infrastructure and an amenity experience that powers the rest of the 200,000 feet, 500,000 feet, or million square feet. So not only are they making more money, they're creating more value. So just like with Whole Foods or Equinox, everyone else in the building pays more to be there. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so I guess the, the next kind of logical question then is if, if there is high demand for this product and it makes more money, for, for sophisticated landlords who want to develop their own brand and, you know, customer interface, what's your view on whether landlords can be successful doing that themselves? And if so, what capability do they need to change in their organisation? How does their thinking need to change? And what tools do they need? I mean, obviously here in New York, there's a bunch of examples, um, you know, Silverstein, Tishman Spire, um, CBRE have launched HANA. Um, how do you see that evolving? And, and I guess the most important part of that question for me is, do you think landlords can be successful in, in doing this without a partner? And if they were to attempt that, what would they need to change? How would they need to change the way they deliver and execute? So um, a number of years ago, I think our hypothesis was that many different kinds of companies would get into this industry, that landlords themselves would start and run products, that hotels would, that maybe that restaurant groups would, uh, that other kind of like, you know, airports, other kind of places that require flexible workplace when it was really just a place would get into this business. And al al although there are a couple of them out there today, there have been many, many landlords who dipped their toe in, started down this path, then backed up and you said, you know what, like this is actually a different business than what I know how to do really well. And many of those have now said, moreover, let me go out and find an exclusive operating partner with whom I can do this all over the country. 
for me, uh, and, and certainly as someone kind of in, in the nuts and bolts of running industry as his business on a day-to-day -day basis, I think the single biggest barrier is that the businesses that Ryan and I both run are true operating businesses in the sense that you need to have expertise for the entire value chain from not only finding the real estate, but designing it and building it, marketing and selling it, and then operating it on a day-to-day -day basis in, a, in a, almost a subscription model where your members, whether they signed on for a month or five years, need to be happy for 10 hours a day, every day, years on end. And the infrastructure that's required to do that with incredible quality and consistency is simply not the same output that most landlords um, have developed real expertise in delivering for, you know, over the past 100 years. Um, so I believe it is possible, but I actually think the, the kind of faster, better, higher quality, lower cost outcome from a landlord point of view is to work with a company that, that breathes that side of the equation um, because I think we can be excellent partners and deliver a lot more value to them and their tenants. These aren't even operating businesses. It's worse than that. These are hospitality companies. And there's a big difference between in being in the service business and being in the hospitality business. And we always say at Convene that hospitality is the emotional human-to-human -human delivery of a service experience. That is very, very, very different than being an investor, very different than being a developer, very different than being a facilities management or property management provider. Um, and my sense is unless a landlord has operating capability vertically integrated, not in services and in construction and in design and in property management, but literally in hospitality, my sense is that they're really going to struggle to deliver a customer experience that will be differentiated enough to compete with industrious, compete with convene. Um, and so my sense is there's a lot of building owners, like every landlord in the world today is making a buy-build partner decision, full stop. Um, and my sense is that the most progressive landlords will be the ones that actually don't do it on their own. They'll be the ones that find a best-in-class partner, whether it's an industrious, a convene, an equium on engagement. Um, now more than ever, because the world is so complicated, if you don't focus on your core competencies and leverage the competencies of others, it's really, really, really hard to differentiate. It's really hard to stay competitive and win over duration. You might be able to win for the next 12 months because you're Tishman Spire and you have a big global portfolio, but we're not playing this game for 12 months. I mean, we're trying to build enduring brands at Industrious and Equium and Convene, and every day all we think about is our customer. How do we deliver a better experience? How do we design a better experience? How do we deliver it? And if I'm Tishman, not to use them as an example, they're focused on how do they become a better real estate investor, a better real estate developer. Very different set of, of competencies. Um, the big fight though right now for us is whose brand? Which is a different question. And I will tell you, we were probably first in the market to do white label brands for building owners that we ran. And I will also tell you that now, based on feedback we've gotten from our customers, we are most likely gonna make the strategic decision that even if we partner with you, it's still gonna be the convened flag and we will not run a white label brand for a building owner other than the ones that we've already committed to do. Um, and so to me, that's the bigger decision right now for companies like Industrious and us and Equium is do we deflag ourselves create an independent brand for a building owner and then let them say, well, it's powered by Convene and you could be a part of our res network and use all of our IP. Mm. Um, and there's pros and cons to that, but I will definitely say for us at Convene now we're leaning towards if it's not our brand, we're probably out of that game. That's really interesting. Just to add on that point, I, I think um, Sometimes in the high-level negotiations about the brand point, it becomes about identity and whose product is it and how do you imbue your culture and your brand through it. It's also about how do you sell the space? And in a world in which one of the many customer acquisition channels is online through digital marketing, like you know the Instagram ad you see when you're flipping on your phone, um, those things take brand power. And it is not going to be feasible for every single landlord to develop the expertise through an agency or in-house 
to power, you know, landlord X on Instagram times a thousand across the country in a way that you can when you're building a scalable business, much like we consume consumer products. So I, I actually think there's like a real business reason to, to think twice before going down that road. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's a, a very interesting kind of, and the brand thing's, you know, super controversial, and I think it's something that everyone's trying to work out at the moment. It's fascinating for me to have this discussion with these guys because, you know, we're all in this same um, kind of area, but um, Equium isn't truly an operator in the hospitality sense of the space. Rather, we provide the platform and the experience layer for a landlord to brand it and do it themselves. Um, but it is something that, you know, where I would completely agree with what's been said, um, it does, it's not as simple as just rolling out an app. It is, it, is, it is completely the opposite of that. It actually requires from those landlords that want to pursue that and the, the customers that we work with, it requires a complete change in thinking about who your customer is, you know, and, and really thinking about managing for the people that occupy this space versus managing the bricks and mortar um, and the built environment itself. So it is, it's a, it's a very different business. I'm getting three or four wrap-ups now from Marielle. Um, I hope you guys have enjoyed the session. We've certainly enjoyed the discussion, and thanks very much, Ryan and Anna.